And you know what? The brain has a difficult time distinguishing between reality and a nightmare. To the to the brain and stuff, it's all real. That's why you react with the heart, the you know, the 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 nervous system, the sweating and everything, because the brain, you at that level, you believe it's really happening to you. Right. Yeah. It, um, so that's what I started doing. I started getting f- fucked up nearly every single single night. Um, how much would it take for you to get fucked up enough to where you could sleep? Uh, th- at that point it was like the, I started drinking a little bit more liquor and then, uh, and then more, uh, you know, just kind of mixing it, liquor and beer. Um, and was there ever any temptation to move to pharmaceuticals? No, no, no. I never, I never, I mean, that's the most pharmaceuticals I did was just a Tylenol and aspirin trying to get rid of those headaches. Um, but no, I never, I never dipped into any any narcotics or anything like that. Yeah. Cause sometimes you get prescribed, you know, Xanax or other stuff, you know, or you'd have a pain pill because you went through it and people would, you know, obviously that's, we saw what happened with Oxycontin and, you know, things like that. So, um, I, I don't want to short circuit a lot uh, of what we're going to talk about too, but I do want to, um, let's talk about the third one because now this happens 11 months after, or now you've got another shooting now within seven months, basically after this one. And this is kind of what sets the stage for you to say, we got to make a change here. So, um, let's cover just at a higher level, but let's talk about the third shooting because I, what I want to do with our time is really get into, um, the rehab, what it took for you to get there, you know, what kind of impact it's made on you. So set the stage now for the third shooting. You know, I assume it's about seven months later, right after this one. Yeah. So the second OIS was April 3rd of 2019. My next OIS was November 9th of 2019. Um, by this point, me and my wife already decided a divorce. Uh, we're living kind of at, I'm, I'm living at hotels or with family and friends or out of my car and at the station or something. Um, and she's doing the same. She's taking the kids and, and life at home is non-existent anymore. Um, I'm back at work. Um, we get a, uh, a, a the the day before the couple of days before my OIS, so November seventh, um, I go out drinking like a madman with my squad, and I leave, and um, I don't tell anybody. I get in my car and I drive home, and I had I had had a lot of drinks and shots within maybe like an an hour, and uh, I come into work the next day, which is November eighth, and my sergeant. He's like, hey, uh, after lineup, I got to talk to you. So he brings me into the office. He's like, man, what happened last night? Why did you leave like that? Why did you drink like that? You know, what's going on? And I kind of BS him, hey, everything is good. Everything is good. Uh, he told me, hey, man, I, if there's something going on with you, I need to know so that I can help you. And I was like, Sarge, I swear this is a one time thing. I didn't even realize I was drinking that much. He's like, okay. So he sent me back out to the street. That was November 8th. The next day on November 9th. I was going to say, that sounds like one of the very few times or the first time somebody actually called you out on your drinking, right? Exactly. Yeah. The, the, he was starting to catch on that something wasn't right with me. And I, I've talked to him obviously since, and, uh, he was telling me like, man, I, I, uh, I couldn't put my finger on what it was. He goes, but as I, as I watched you drink that night and, 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 you know, when you were at work, like there was there was something different about you and I didn't know what it was. He goes in, I just couldn't put my finger on what it was. You know, you're, cause again, I was a hundred percent, I was a hundred percent at work. There was nothing going on at work. Nobody knew what was going on. So, um, the next day after he talked to me, I got in my third OIS and, uh, it, it was a home invasion robbery suspect who had taken an F-150, uh, from a home. The following day, he shot somebody at a Motel 6 down in San Isidro. On the third day, uh, we we have the we get the vehicle occupied, and it turns into a short vehicle pursuit. It ends up going into a cul-de-sac. And when it goes into that cul-de-sac, the number one per, uh, vehicle in the pursuit uh, followed, the, followed the vehicle, the F-150, into that cul-de-sac. Me and my partner were number two in that pursuit. We try to. I was driving. I tried to bottleneck that cul-de-sac so that F-150 couldn't come back out. And now it's a face-off between our SUV and the F-150. And so I'm getting out of the car to conduct the hot stop. You know, we have the to have get the get the driver at gunpoint. My partner is getting out of the passenger side, and as he's getting out, the F-150 f- runs into the front of our SUV, and it, as it rolls back, it 
hits the passenger so the passenger door shut, closes it. At one point, I see my partner coming out, and then the next second, he's gone. And this is eleven o'clock at night on on November 9th. I start backpedaling to the back of our SUV. Uh, the F one fifty is taking out the entire passenger side of our of our SUV, and. I remember seeing, as it's passing by me, I remember seeing a black object riding on the grill of the F-150. And I remember thinking to myself, well, there goes my partner, and he's going to go down the road. I can't let him go for this ride. Um, so I start shooting inside the the uh, the F-150. Now, the F-150 was occupied by the driver who was a suspect and a female passenger. And uh, as the F-150 continues going and I'm, you know, I shoot three, four rounds, <clears throat> I go to reholster. The F-150 continues going. The driver throws a gun out the window. And as I'm reholstering in my peripheral on my left-hand side, I remember seeing this black, uh, 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 something black flopping on the ground. And it felt like, it, it felt like I had, I was there for about 10 minutes, but I remember thinking to myself, that's my partner. And I don't want to help him. You know, I don't want to help him. I don't want to see it. I don't want to turn around and have to deal with it. Um, he had just came back from baby leave uh, uh, that that month. He had his first newborn son at home. Um, our squads were tight. You know, our, we all knew each other's family and our moms and brothers and sisters. We get invited to family functions. And I just remember thinking, like, what am I going to tell his wife tonight? And, and I felt horrible. Um, and it felt like forever. I was thinking that, and I finally turned around to render aid <clears throat> to my partner. And I realized that it wasn't my partner. It was the, our rear bumper of our SUV that was kind of flopping in the wind. And my partner comes out and he's looking at me like, and I'm like, what the fuck happened? Like, I thought I was looking at a ghost. So I was like, what the fuck? I'm like, well, let's get back into the pursuit. So we hop back in. I'm like, are you all right, bro? He's like, yeah. And I was like, man, I, th I thought you I thought you got ran over. He's like, no, I dove back into the car. And I didn't see that. Well, my entire world came crashing down that night because um, <clears throat> three OIS is in 18 months. I shot at a moving vehicle. San Diego PD, uh, you know, they it's kind of frowned upon to kind of shoot at a moving vehicle. Um, so I understood that I did it. There was a female passenger inside. I hope I didn't shoot her. But did you know at the time there was a female passenger? Yeah. Yeah, I knew. Okay. But, but here's the other thing. And I'm not, and I'm not trying to come to your defense, but I'm coming to your defense. Look, you just had a guy who's a suspect, right? Home invasion. You know, he's dangerous, right? He rams a marked police car with you standing outside the car. I mean, if that doesn't constitute a threat and he's backing up to do it again, if that doesn't constitute a threat, what does? Right. And I think, I think a lot of it was at the time, <clears throat> you know, when I saw that black object on the grill of the F-150 and I thought it was my partner, uh, you know, it, it, we always tell people, you could make a decision, you know, make, you know, we always, I, I tell my trainee, you know, I told my trainees when I was an FTO, make a decision. Think of the best decision to make and make it. Even if it's the wrong decision, at least you make a decision. And this is one of those decisions that I I decided to make at that time, whether right or wrong. Some people are like, oh, you shouldn't have shot because, you know, there was a female passenger. And I usually tell those people to shut the fuck up because they weren't with they weren't they weren't there. They weren't seeing, smelling, hearing, feeling what I just saw and did. But at the end of the day, I made the decision to fire, you know, rounds even with the female passenger inside. Um but again, all these things are going through my mind. And with the, one of the main things that I was thinking was, oh my God, did I just make up everything that I saw? Because I know that I'm not feeling well. I know I'm paranoid. I know I'm not sleeping. Um, and did I just make all this up? Did my BWC capture what, what, I, what I thought I saw? And I hope it did. And uh, I'm a liability. Like, I'm going to get fired. And I started, my world came crashing down. I remember going back to, uh, I remember getting picked up from the scene and I'm going back to, uh, by my peer support officer, he's driving me back to the station. And I remember think I remember saying something out loud, like, man, I can't believe this is happening to me again. And he turned around and he looked at me and said, Hey M Mike, you know what? If, if God, if God didn't think that you can handle this, he wouldn't put you through it. And I remember thinking, you know, 
well, me and God parted ways a long time ago. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in him anymore because I've, I've been begging and asking him for these, these headaches and these nightmares and the paranoia to go away. And, uh, and, you know, I'm doing God's work and, and, and you're not doing anything for me. So me and him split ways a long time ago. And I just remember him saying that to me. And, um, I go back to the station and it was, very different compared to what my other OISs were, where the captains and there's assistant chiefs and there's lieutenants and the brass is there and people are telling me, good job and you're a hero or hey, I'm glad you're not hurt. This time, only the captain showed up. And it was very, I was like, fuck, I'm in trouble. Like, this is not a good shoot. Something's wrong. It tastes different. It smells different. This looks different. It feels different. Well, let's um, put a pin in this for just a second and conclude the part. So you fired the shots. Was was this was the the suspect arrested? So bring us to resolution because when you say OIS, there can be an OIS where you f- shots are fired but nobody's hurt or somebody's hurt or shots fired and somebody's killed. What what happened in this one when you fired into the uh, vehicle? Uh, so the uh, was the that your suspect- imaginary dog again? Yeah, it's, I'm telling you, meth is a hell of a drug. <laughs> I think his paranoia is coming back. Quiet. <laughs> we can, don't worry, we can't hear him. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so uh, yeah, so the suspect was uh, taken into custody by the SWAT team r- later on that morning. Um, and then the female, she was, uh, she was caught within uh, a few minutes after the vehicle pursuit. But uh, neither one of them were injured from the shooting? Neither uh, one of them were injured from the shooting. There was two rounds that were that impacted the uh, passenger side door. The round that – there was one round that uh, kind of fell into the passenger side pocket of the door. If it would have continued going through and through, it would have struck the uh, female. So God was watching over all of us that night for sure. So um, – but but when did you know for a fact that you hadn't shot anybody, that all you had done was just shot, shoot? Was it that night or did it take later? Yeah, so it was it was uh it, it was within like maybe forty five thirty, forty five minutes after the pursuit was when they found the female. Um and, and I when I heard that they had taken her into custody and they were they were taking her in to be interviewed or whatever, um, I knew that she wasn't she obviously wasn't being transported to the hospital, so she was good. And uh we hadn't found the suspect yet, so I just didn't know. It, it wasn't until gosh, when was it? You know what you know what? It wasn't until um the next day when I when uh I, I heard that the suspect was taken into custody. He was barricaded inside an apartment complex. Wow. So you go through all of this. So this is your third shooting. And I don't want to say fortunately, but fortunately, this one didn't involve the loss of life, but it still involved you going through, thought your partner had just been run over. Yeah, he's attached to the front of that grill. Um, you're firing shots in self-defense. Um, what happened with the shooting this third time? You know, just kind of give us the Reader's Digest version, because I want to I want to get into the you know, the the rehab and the stuff that comes. But did this one, was this one um more troubling uh, in terms of resolving from an investigative standpoint, you know, what happened with this third shooting? You know, to be honest, I, I don't, I don't really even know as far as it, it, the, I, I went through the entire homicide investigation. Again, I went home that night to an empty house. I started pounding drinks. I didn't sleep for two days. The, the San Diego police department, after a critical incident, we have debriefs um, after, uh, after all the OISs. So this debrief was scheduled for, Monday at eight o'clock, my shooting happened on Saturday around 1130 at night. I, I had no sleep. Uh, I was late to, um, to the debrief on Monday. Monday, it was at eight o'clock. I didn't get there till about 845 and I was drunk as shit. I hadn't, I hadn't slept in two days. I was paranoid. I knew I was going to get fired. I'm like, man, I'm going to get fired. My wife wasn't even staying at the house. <clears throat> um, so I had the house to myself. I go into um, I go into Southern Division, and as I'm walking to the debrief, the wellness unit was there to greet me, uh, Deanna, Dada, uh, and one of the sergeants. And you know they smiling, and, and 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 you know when you're when you're when you're drunk and you haven't slept for two days, it's kind of hard to look into people's eyes. And you, my eyes were bloodshot. I, I I could smell the alcohol on me, even though like I was like spraying cologne on and shit. This sounds like the beginning of an intervention. Did you have any idea that's why they were there? 
no. So they told me, Hey, we want you to come up to the wellness unit. And I was like, man, I'm not, I'm not going, I got stuff to do. And I'm late to this debrief. So I go into the debrief. I come out, they're still waiting for me. They're like, Hey, you're going to come up to the wellness unit. So I finally go, I sit down, I go to the wellness unit, which is at headquarters. And I'm like, well, I'm going to get fired now. I sit down and Deanna says like, Hey, how's, how's, uh, how's everything going? How's your family? How's your wife? And I said, everybody's good. Everybody's oh, great. Yeah. See, I'm gonna say, Here comes the bullshit answer. No, I'm fine. Yeah. We're doing good. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait, no, I'm living in a hotel out of my car. I'm <laughs> sleeping yeah. at the station. Haven't talked to my wife in three days, but no, man, we're solid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's exactly, I was like, Hey, we are good. Everything is good. She's supportive. She said, well, how's your sleep? And I said, my sleep is good. I over, that's why I was late today. You know, I overslept. I was late to the debrief and she's like, all right. And she's like, hey, you know what? Your whole life is fucked up and you don't even know it. And now I'm looking at her and now I think, now I'm thinking like, man, am I on a fucking A&E intervention show? Like I'm waiting, I'm looking for the, ca- I'm looking for the cameras inside the office. Like what's going on? And uh, she's basically said, you know, we've talked to people who love and care about you. And uh, we think that you're using alcohol to cope with some of these uh, um, critical incidents that you've been involved with. I want to offer you an opportunity to go get help at a first responder only treatment facility. And at the time I was like, man, fuck that. I'm not 5150 or I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. I'm good. And she said, well, here, take this, take these pamphlets home, look over it and uh, I'll follow up with you. Well, she followed up with me every single, my, my debrief was on Monday. She followed up with me Monday evening, Tuesday, Tuesday evening, Wednesday. And then finally, finally on Thursday, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go and, um, why, why did you, why did you make that? What, what changed between Monday when you told them to piss off everything solid and Thursday? So I had nothing to lose. Um, I, I had, uh, I had no, you know, I was already losing my wife and kids. Um, I thought I was going to get fired. So I was going to lose my career money my reputation, right? Because regardless of, and I always say this, regardless of what you do throughout your career, if you get fired, that's the last thing anybody remembers of you, right? Oh, that was the drunk that got fucking fired for two DUIs, right? Nobody remember, nobody cares about 15 years ago when you saved some officer's life, (laughs) like nobody, right? Nobody remembers that stuff. And I, and I knew that, and I I had been a long, I had been there at the, with the department long enough to know that that's kind of what happens when, with our reputation. So I was losing everything already and I, I had nothing to lose. Well, how did you get over the, uh, the thing you were talking about? You didn't want to be the first one to complain. You didn't want to be the guy who says, I can't handle it. Right. Because that's what's been going through your mind up until now. So, so I already, I, in my mind, I knew that I was going to get fired. So I was like, before I get fired, I'm going to let the department take care of me because I know that I'm fucked up. I, I knew, I knew I knew that I was not normal, that the paranoia, the constant paranoia, even when I was sober and, and the, uh, the drinking and the nightmares and the headache, I knew that that was not normal. Um, and I knew that I was already going to get fired. So I literally had nothing. I, I waited to the point where I had nothing to lose. And, and again, my, my wife and my kids were not even in the house anymore. So I, I already knew I was losing it all. Dealing with two parents who were alcoholics and, you know, um, it's just, and, you know, understanding that nobody wants help. You have to, like they say, you literally have to hit rock bottom before you're ready to accept help. I mean, there's no, I'm still good. You're still on the downhill slide, but you got to have that hard, solid, you know, thud at the end to go. This is, I've, this, there is nowhere else to go. I mean, this is as bad as it gets, right? And, 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 you know, I always say to rock bottom, you know, when somebody hits rock bottom, you, that, that person, they'll find a basement to that rock bottom. And then that's rock bottom. <laughs> like there's a, there, there, there is there, you can go a little lower than, than rock bottom. And I think that's where I was at. And, um, so I just decided, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to take this opportunity and I'm going to get the help. And I said, yes. And, uh, best, uh, best, best thing that I've ever done in my life. Best decision that I've ever made in my life. So talk about how did you, so you made that decision, how long between you make the decision and you go there and then what's, how do you talk about this with your wife and kids? So, uh, my kids were still really young, so that I didn't really have to explain much to them. Um, I, I remember my wife came home, you know, and I, and I said, Hey, uh, I need to talk to you. And she's like, okay, what's up? And I said, Hey, you know, 
Deanna, one of the ladies at the wellness unit, gave me this pamphlet, and I think I'm going to go. And she said, okay. She said, and then go. And again, we were already going through a divorce. Like we, I didn't know if she was, I didn't think she was going to stick around. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to go. And I think I'm going this week. So from the point that I said yes to Deanna, she basically said, do you want to go today? I can take, we can go right now. And I was like, well, shit, not right now. I got to, I got this, you know, I bring out my list of everything. I wait, hold I got, on. Wait, I, got, I still got a case of Modelo. I got a yeah, yeah. Hey. <laughs> So, so we ended up going, literally, I think we ended up going like a, like a day later. I, I, I said yes on Wednesday and I was there by Friday or so, something to that effect. Or maybe I said yes on Friday and I was there on Monday morning. Well, that shows um, how screwed up you were at that time because you knew the dates of these shootings. You got details. But with this, it's like, right. It's like. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing is all, I remember all the negative that happened during those 18 months. I remember these nightmares that the, my, the way I was feeling, but one thing I don't remember or many things I don't remember is I don't remember any spending any holidays, any birthdays with my kids, with my family, my own birthday, um, special events. I do not remember the toys that my kids played with when they were little, like their favorite toy, what, what, their favorite cartoon that they watched on TV. And that was, it's such a, is a, it was so much wasted time. Um, I regret that. You know, I, I, I think that it was, uh, you know, that's time that you can't get back. You'll never, I'll never get back. My kids will never be that small again, you know? And, and, uh, you know, I, I ruined that opportunity for myself to, to enjoy those, those moments. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's <clears throat> you're making it sound like it's an intentional thing. It wasn't. It was the circumstances you were undergoing. Um, and, you know, a lot of guys go through the tough guy. I'm not going to be the weak one. I'm going to be the tough one. But the same way in DEA, we always remember the worst about everybody, never the best. So it's, uh, you know, I'm not giving you excuses, but I'm giving you reasons why. Yeah. And, and I think that's what leads to the, this, inordinate amount of suicides. It's very similar to the military, you know, the mm-hmm. number of suicides law enforcement has because, and, and for too long, there's been a stigma. Well, I'm not going to ask for help because if I ask for help, I'm going to be perceived as weak. Nobody's going to want to work with me. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, unfortunately, it's just, it, like I said, it was taboo to talk about for too long, but you know and I know. I mean, I, I look back and I can think about the number of friends I've lost in the line of duty is not as many as the number of friends I've lost to suicide. Mm. Yep. Yeah, very true. So talk about this program now. So it's a first responder only program. When it's first responders, does that mean police, fire? I mean, the fire guys are already used to sleeping most of the day away. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not much of a change for them. They get to they get to meditate and and uh and exercise and work out and do yoga and all kinds of stuff. It's they like do being that on already. Duty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um so yeah, so I go to this facility and I'm still paranoid. I'm nervous. I knew I'm gonna lose my job because because I know that they're going to, you know, uh, deem me as crazy when I get there. But I was, I was good with it. Um, I had made peace with that, that decision. And um, oh, wait a minute, what made you think that you were the only, you were the special one, that you were the only guy? Nobody knows what I'm. Nobody's been through this. Nobody's got it as bad as I do, right? Is that was kind of is that your mentality going in? That you know, if you guys only knew what I'm going through. N- no, 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 no. I, I, I don't think. Um, I don't know what I thought, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite that. It was more so of, of, um, I, I didn't, I don't, I didn't think that they knew how bad I was that I was hiding it. So when I, when I did go to this facility and I was going to be seen by doctors and clinicians that they were going to be like, man, you are fucking crazy, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, you're not going to get your job back. You know, that's, that's man, what got I was a separate thinking. Facility for you. You're on the whack. Exa- out exactly. We're sending you to a different location. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we can't help you over here. <laughs> Do they so, have any imaginary dogs there? No, 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 no imaginary dogs. No imaginary. <laughs> right, Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. So, so tell us about the program. How was it structured? Uh, you know, length. You know, and so first of all, how long were you there? And then tell us about what they did to get you from where you were to where you needed to be. Yeah, so I was there for twenty six days. So I spent uh, I spent November and December of twenty nineteen there. I spent Thanksgiving in in uh, treatment of 2019 and I got released maybe like, I think it was like two days before Christmas of 2019. Um, so when you get there, you know, um, 
there was guys from a bunch of different agencies throughout the nation. There was about maybe you know eight, eight, eight or nine other guys, uh, two fire guys, and um, and I was the youngest baby in there. I was uh, literally a baby. Like these guys were OGs, uh, you know, been in the profession 20, 30 years, 47 years. Uh, one of the guys was in the profession for 47 years. And, um, and, and, and they're all just looking at me, you know, like, and they, and they, they, asked, you know, I remember one guy was like, bro, how many, and they're looking at me like, who the fuck is this kid in here? You know, like what's wrong, what's wrong with him? You need a paper cut sort, you yeah, know, the, the exa- exactly, <laughs> exactly. And he said, he said, bro, how long have you, how long do you have on? And I said, well, I got, I got three years on, you know, with my chest, you know, my chest puffed out. And I'm like, I got three years on at the time. I only had two and a half, but when you're talking to OGs, you got to bring it up a little bit. Right. So I was like, I was like, I got three years on, I got three years on. And they're like, what the fuck's wrong with you? And I was like, I, I don't know. I think I, I, they say I'm drinking too much or something. And they're like, well, just stop fucking drinking. And in my mind, I'm like, why? Well, I wish it was that easy, but yeah. you that's know, good advice. You know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> just stop. It's very simple. What's the next problem? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it was funny. I, I you know, I start doing the group therapy. So all the stuff that, I mean, you're living there 24 seven inside this, this, uh, this home. Um, and, and there's, there's clinicians, there's group therapy, uh, uh, there's group sessions, there's one-on-one sessions with the doctor. Um, that was the first time that I started doing EMDR, which is that eye movement desensitization reprocessing, um, which um, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, um, expert on it, but it, it it works whatever however it works by reprocessing the memories and the feelings and you know filing them correctly inside your brain it 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 helped a lot so you know i participated in everything because i knew i was going to get fired i knew that i had to have a stronger you know uh um uh I needed to be stronger coming out of here to deal with when I get fired and when I go through my divorce. So I was like, man, I'm going to participate in everything. So I did the group sessions, the one-on-one sessions, EMDR, paint therapy, yoga, meditation, breathing exercises. They had equine therapy, which was awesome. I loved it. Um, uh, what else did they have? Acupuncture. Could you have left at any time if you wanted to? I could have left. Yeah, I could have left at any Did you think about leaving? I would say the first couple of days, um, I was like, I was like, man, I, I was, I was like homesick already. So I was like, this, this is, this ain't for me. Um, but not, not so much. I, I just, I, I don't think I ever got to that point where like, yeah, I'm going to leave. Uh, but it crossed my mind. Do you think about sneaking out for a beer or anything? You know, that was, that was the, the amazing thing was, uh, I craved beer cause I felt like shit for like two weeks just because I, I still had the headaches. I wasn't sleeping, but there was a, there was a, I, and I can't remember the exact time frame, but it was about two weeks when I remember waking up and I remember, I remember waking up and I'm like, holy shit, something's different. I slept through the whole night. I slept through the entire night for the first time. Um, and, and my brain felt like it had taken its first breath in, in ever. It was, it it felt like my brain was oxygenated and it was just, it was a weird, it was a weird, weird feeling where I was just like, holy shit, something, something, something's different, you know? And, but when I was there, I started going, uh, you know, I started listening to my, you know, they had, a my church online, uh, my, my church has a, like an online thing. And I started listening to the, you know, church online and, and I started exercising again and working now we're eating good, um, eating three meals a day and, and you being able to like, you know, share your experience. But the main thing that I picked up from this entire, this entire, um, uh, experience was yes, I got better. Uh, I found methods to help me like meditation and, and, and breathing exercises, all these things that that I still use to this day. But the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway was all these OGs that I was in there with, not one of those guys had ever been involved in an officer involved shooting. And I'm talking about these guys had from 15 to 47 years in the profession. And I'm, I'm the baby in there with, two and a half years, three years, which I, what I told them. And not one of those guys had been involved in one OIS, but they were all fucked up like me. 
I can they ask all you a had question. The, yeah. What made you think you were going to get more respect by saying three years instead of two and a half years? See, I'm still. I'm <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know, but I just I drunk. said that I like I was like I was like I know I have two and a half years, but you just you, yeah, you gotta, three. You gotta oh, say you're three. at three, man. You're an OG now. You're, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're it sounds a little better, right? Like, hey, how many years you have on two and a half? How many years you have on three years? Okay, I'm gonna listen to you a little bit more. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's just what I remember thinking. Like, I'm I'm gonna tell them three years. What was their What was their reaction when they found out about your three shootings? After I, I remember after a couple of days and I shared my I shared my 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 story with them in, in the group setting, um they were like, Holy shit, bro, they didn't take you out of the field and you know, like, dude, that is crazy. Like you got in three OISs and it, that's unheard of. And uh they and and you know, that's when I explained to them, like, man, I was I was good to go at work. Like I I was good at work. Work was like good, I was a hundred percent at work and um they were just all amazed that I had even been involved in two, let alone my third one, which got me in there. What were they in there for? Um, was it because, uh, you know, sometimes after a while, I mean, you may not be involved in an OIS, but if you work bad accidents, if you're a detective right. and see bad things, you know, you see death on a regular basis, that can screw with you in a lot of different ways, too. So w- when you talk with them, some of their stories, what were what were theirs? Yeah. And that's that's exactly what I what, what I took away from is that cumulative stress or those compound critical incidents in a 15, 20, 47 year career, you know, all that stuff that we, that we talked about, the stuff that they were talking about during the group sessions that, and and it's not just the baby deaths or the, um, you know, um, turning on the wrong street and then you get there and your partner's already seriously injured and they had to retire and feeling that guilt of like, fuck, I, I turned on that wrong street. I was one minute late and could I have made a difference? Um, you know, people burning alive in cars, right? <laughs> like, like th- all these guys had been involved, uh, you know, one of the deputy or the correctional guys, it was uh saw a dude getting his head sawed off in, in his cell, but he couldn't go in. He had to wait for backup to come before. And he's just the guy, whatever guy was just using some type of razor to hack, hack his, Sally's head completely off, right? And I'm like, holy shit. So there it, it's all these different things that these guys, these cumulative, cumulative compound critical incidents that were happening throughout their career, and then life. And that's one thing when I when I, I always make sure that I tell people, like, hey, it's not just work. Just because I had a bad fucking day and I I I, I had to go and give a, a death notification to a mom who who's screaming and yelling because she just lost her child. Yeah, that hurts a little bit, right? But now does that does all that just does life at home pause? Do, do does that just mean that my wife's not going to have a bad day? We're not going to get in an argument? Does that mean that my kids uh, are not going to get in trouble with the law and they're not addicted to drugs and alcohol? Our family members don't question, you know, how we acted during a certain incident or why do we shoot so many times at the suspect? So these these guys we're going through stuff at work and life continued on when they got home and they're and, and and what do they bring into this profession right some some officers or some law enforcement officers were molested they were beaten as kids uh they were are they lost a parent or they lost a brother or a sister at a at a, at a young age right i mean they go, you know, they, they, they living out of their car throughout their entire, like, you know, elementary and middle school career, like that, all these they all this baggage that you bring into this profession. And then what you see in this profession and you see smell you have to do. And then when you come home and sometimes for some people, you know, uh, life just doesn't stop no matter where they're at and they just can't get away. And, and, uh, and that's what I, that's one of the biggest takeaways that I learned. I was like, Holy shit, these guys have the same symptoms as I had substance abuse. And and some of these guys were alcohol and dope and or dope, um, um, suicidal. I was never that, but some, some of them, they were, well, you weren't uh, yet. Uh, Give it a couple nah, more well, years. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I always, I always say I was probably weeks or days away from it. I mean, it was, it, it after talking to these, some of these guys and other people, you know, once I got out, you know, you just throw in, a, you just throw in no sleep and alcohol, man, you get, it's not, it's not hard to get there. Right. And then you throw in a divorce, you throw in, you know, uh, the, 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 the loss of a child. 
Yeah, it's 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 it manifests itself differently in everybody, but it continues to manifest itself till you get help. Yeah. And you know something you mentioned too, I remember as a trooper going through the academy, they never prepared us for certain things. I had one week where I had to deliver three separate death notifications, including one of the accidents I worked, a father and daughter killed when a cement truck hit them, T-boned them at an intersection that was under construction, which ended up being a huge civil trial. And you know, the thing was, nobody ever prepared you for that. Nobody ever taught you how to, this is how you do it. This is how you deal with it. And then, you know, I was thinking back to, I actually ended up writing a paper about this when I was doing a degree program. Uh, but, you know, you think about this, You one of the things that affects cops more than anything else are, uh, you know, especially kids, babies. And I get, the, you get, there's two calls, like I say, cops usually never want to get, which is officer down and baby not breathing. And I got the baby not breathing. And I do four CPR on this 18 month old. She happened to be the granddaughter of the secretary at the highway patrol. And, um, so I knew him. I knew the family. And I'm doing CPR on this kid for 45 minutes. Have to, I mean, even while I run out to just run out to the ambulance, ride in the ambulance, I stay doing CPR until I'm basically pulled out of the ER. And then the worst news, they come out later and you could tell it's like the child didn't make it, had pneumonia, just basically fell. And, you know, the thing is I got to thinking about is no, no peer support. I actually had somebody say, I, I won't say who, but I had somebody say, uh, a ranking officer basically say, well, if it was me, I would have come back to work, even if I was just half there. It's like no consolation, like, how are you feeling? What are you doing? It's just like, mm-hmm. well, just suck it up, buttercup, and get back to work. And yeah. I had no clue, you know? And I think, to your point, had I, when I read the book all those years later, is Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement, that was like the son of a bitch was in my head looking at stuff and writing that book. That's me. Okay, that's me too. That's me. I'm going, damn. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's eerily accurate. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's a, uh, it, it was a, uh, no, that was, it was amazing, an amazing experience. And again, I, I remember, I remember one of the first times I heard, uh, it, you know, a mom, a mom, a mom screaming when she lost her child. And I was a pretty, I mean, I was a baby cop. I was like still in, in phase training. And I just remember that, like, it, it wasn't my kid, but you could almost, you could almost feel that pain just by hearing that scream right there's only one a mother's scream is so unique that i feel like they're all the same because it's like it, nobody else screams like that a, a wife doesn't scream like that a, a girlfriend or a sister like a mother scream when she loses her child it's like from the depths of the soul and i just remember like i remember going home that day and feeling like holy shit like i it just like gives you like the goosebumps and it, yes, and it, and it fucked with me for a couple of days. Like it was just that I can always, and I still remember that to this day. I can remember what that sounded like. It's man, this is bringing back some, it's the same thing. When I was the, sitting there at the ER, they brought the mother in. Um, and it's like, you're right. That's the sound. That's the sounds you just never forget. And then just seeing her walking out of there. And it's like, I thought I felt like shit. And then you see her and then you realize, man, you know, uh, I don't mm-hmm. even compare, but it's, but you know, for too many years, they never trained you for how to deal with that. It's not like, don't, I don't need to be a baby and, you know, put diapers on me and I don't need a, you know, binky, but give me some tools. It's like, you teach me how to fire a weapon. You teach me how to do a defensive tactics. You teach me how to do arrest. Why don't you teach me how to deal with critical incidents? Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's all, it seems like that always takes a back burner. Although now it seems like it's it's becoming more prevalent in agencies. Um, my partner and I just got back from Vancouver, uh, British Columbia Police Conference. This just got back uh, Tuesday, this past Tuesday, and it was resiliency in law enforcement. And it was all about you know they've had some um, <clears throat> excuse me they've had some suicides in their agency, and you, and you got to respect them. They're taking the bull by the horns and they're stepping up to the plate. The chief came in. Spoke to everybody at the beginning of the conference for about 25 minutes. I mean, and, and listen to this man. I told him afterwards, after he left, that's a man I could work for because he showed so much concern for his employees. And as, he wasn't up there to brag about stats or we're doing this in the agency, we're doing that. It was all about, here's what we're doing for our people. They had three comfort dogs there for a conference that was like, I don't know, 175, 180 people. They had a quiet room. Now, when I first heard that, I got to tell you, I thought, really? I mean, are, Really, you need a quiet room. This is a conference. I mean, these there's no stress in here. This is fun. 
but that's their concern for their employees. And you just, I that's just awesome. had so much respect for that agency afterwards to see, you know, they gave me, I got a picture with one of their comfort dogs. They gave me, the dogs have player cards, just like, you know, the old <laughs> football players. Yeah. Uh, and to see what the, the links at which law enforcement agencies are going to now to prevent what you went through, Mike, you know, to get you some help at the very first opportunity, even though, like I told you earlier, I, I never got help from when my partner got shot. And I told him that story, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> it's funny because Michelle, who was the controller of Zen, one of the dogs, she came afterwards and she's like, you want to you go in a quiet room and talk? No, I don't want to go in a quiet room. Let's go eat. <laughs> How was yours? No, I'm okay. I haven't had your, I haven't had dreams in over ten years. I'm good. <laughs> well, and that was the funny part too, because when we interviewed his partner, I believe it was episode six. Was that was the first time though you and your partner had yeah. talked about it in since it happened. Twenty he got shot in eighty nine, and we talked about it in twenty one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and it, it wasn't that it was taboo. It was just you know he came to work. I, he came back to work after about a year and. It's like, dude, let's, I got this case going. Let's go. Come on, I need some help over here. And he yeah, jumped and, right in there. And when you were talking about that chief, and you said Vancouver. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's that's uh, that's that's awesome that he did that because what it does is sometimes, uh, you know, this whole wellness thing and taking care of yourself and and breaking that stigma, it, it has to come from the top down. You're if exactly the top, right. If the top supports it. Um, Everybody else is going to have to support it, right? If the chief or the sheriff is saying, "Hey, this is what I support. This is what I want. This is what's important to me," um, people are going to have people are going to make that happen. And uh, in San Diego PD, we always tell pe- we always tell from the kids that come in. They're not kids. I call them kids, but the, you know right. these. Oh yeah, because you're officers. an OG now. I'm yeah, because I'm an old man. I'm old. an old man here. <laughs> <laughs> but three years on, um, you know, these these new officers that are coming in as, in their orientation, right, before they even hit the academy, they're in pre-orientation and they're already hearing about wellness and we're trying to break that stigma. Uh, and we're and, and that's what it, it's all about. It's breaking that stigma, because if you an, an agency can have every resource available at all these all these vendors that come to all these conferences, they can utilize every single one and have them at their fingertips. But if the if the boots on the ground are not utilizing or they don't trust the system or trust that they're going to be supported from the top down, then it's going to be a waste of money. All those all those resources is just a big waste of money if you have not broken the stigma within your agency or your department and um, and you're not getting support from the top. And I always tell people, too, you don't necessarily need support from the top. Just like the community has forced us to change laws and change tactics and change policies and procedures, the boots on the ground can uh, help each other, right? The OGs can take youngsters under their wing. That's exactly it right there, right? In other words, you would have been much better served if the culture had been back then as being told by other guys, hey, here's what I went through. I went, you know, in, in other words getting it out of your mind sooner rather than later that it's not taboo to talk about that. It's not taboo to say, Hey, um, this is the way I'm feeling, you know, because to your yeah. point, the brass can be all behind it, but unless it's implemented at the tip of the spear, the people that are, that are suffering from it, you know, are saying, Hey dude, I've been through this. It's okay. That's where I think what you're doing there is smart, you know, in terms of getting to them early as they're coming into the Academy. It's like, I tell people, it's my theory of the seatbelt. The reason my kids wear seatbelts without throwing a fit is because that's the only thing they've known growing up. We get into the car, what do you do? You exactly. put the seatbelt on, right? So Absolutely. it's not anything to have to train them on. This is the way it's always been. But let's kind of use that to transition to the final piece of this. So you come out of this, um, and I think we'll save this for a, a different time, but but you were involved in a fourth uh, shooting. But uh, well, actually, you know, let's, let's, no, let's, you know what, screw this. We got, we got, let's just spend a little time on it. I could, I could dip it. I could dip into it and, and I could well, but, bang but, it out real but, quick. But now you've got different tools available for you, right? So now tell us about the fourth shooting and how this shooting is different from the previous three. Well, just, just before you do, Mike, how long were you in rehab before the headache stopped? I, I, I want to say it was like a, maybe I want to say it was like two, the headaches really never have gone away. I, even to this day, every once in a while, I'll still get, I'll still get headaches. Um, I've gone to see a neurologist. I've, I've, I've played with different medications to see which, which one, uh, takes the headache away. So, um, they've never really went away, but they, they have become so much less frequent and they've become so much, um, uh, uh, they become less, uh, intense. 
intense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. But it, it, it was probably, I would say maybe about two weeks where I kind of started having gaps in between my, that daily, every single day headache. Um, but the sleep, that was one of the first things I just remember is I slept an entire night for the first time in, you know, since April 3rd of 2019. And I was just, it was just kind of like, I, it was like, again, it just felt like my brain took a deep breath of fresh air. <laughs> That's what well, it felt like when I woke into up. That, like you say, that deep REM sleep, you got the chance to, you know, have your brain waves rewired. So let's talk about this fourth shooting and how it's different and then how that led into what you're doing now. Yeah. So, so, you know, I came back from the facility. I ended up going back out to the street, which I was, I was good to go. I was healthy. I was, I was good to go. I went back out to the street in 2020. <clears throat> and then 2021, um, the wellness unit tapped me on the shoulder and, and Deanna, the one that told me that my whole life was fucked up in that, during that intervention, <laughs> she, uh, she tapped me on the shoulder. She's like, Hey, how would you like to work at the wellness unit? And I was out on the street. I was still proactive. I was still getting guns and dope and, you know, chasing bad guys. And I was still having a good time. And, and I was like, yeah, may, you know, one of these days, like in 15 years when I'm all old and shit, like you guys, you know, I, not right now. I'm, a, I'm still young. I only got five years on. Like I'm, I'm, I'm still out here getting it. And she's like, no, oh, no, I'm no talking you, to- you had four and a half years on. You just made it. Yeah. Five yeah. That, I just made that up. I just made that, that, that six months up. Um, yeah. So she, she said, no, you know, more, more like in a couple of months. And I was like, well, and I love her. I love her to death. So I didn't know how to say no to her. So I said, well, let me, let me talk to my captain. We're short staffed out in patrol. I don't think she's going to, uh, she's, she's going to allow that to happen, but let me ask her. And, uh, Deanna comes back with, Hey, don't even worry about asking her. The chief already approved it. You're coming to the wellness unit. So I was like, oh shit. So wow, crap. <laughs> um yeah. So I was kind of voluntold. And this is back in 2000, like in June of 2021. And um in and I had a it's been it's been wonderful. It's been a blast. Um I was it's like peer support on steroids. You know, again, our wellness unit is our one-stop shop for all employee resources, whether you're a civilian or sworn or a family member. Um I was able to provide, I was rolling out to OISs and, and kind of helping people out with that or coordinating, you know, peer supporters to, to come to OISs or in custody deaths. So it was fun, but I, I always say at the end of the day, I'm a cop and I, and I needed that adrenaline rush hit, right? I missed, I'm not an office guy. I miss being out in the street. So in 2021, what I was doing is every other weekend, I would go work patrol overtime. And I was having fun getting it. I was getting involved in stuff on my one day of, of patrol overtime. And on January 10th of 2022, um, I signed up for an easy, in, in quotes, easy overtime. And I got involved in that fourth OIS. And yeah, so on, on January 10th of 2022, that's when I was involved in my in my fourth OIS. Uh, it on was, a quote, it was, easy Assignment, on a quote, right? e- yeah, quote, easy assignment. Me, uh, you know, we signed up for an easy overtime assignment. And, and what was uh, and it, what was the assignment? It was a neighborhood policing division uh, or neighborhood policing assignment. So basically, we uh, uh, we provide resources and we respond to transient related issues, and, and we try to provide resources to to the uh, to the homeless um, out in downtown or, or whatever area that you you were assigned to for that for that overtime shift. So it, it's. It is pretty, it's a pretty easy, uh, easy gig. Um, seven o'clock in the morning, uh, my partner and I are in downtown and, uh, the radio call comes out. It's, it, this is on a, on a Monday morning. Same partner as you've had before. Yeah. So uh, all of my four OISs, I've had the same partner three times and, uh, and, and a different one on the, on the third one, but, uh, yeah, Mike, Mike Muniz, that's my, that's my good buddy. We, uh, and, and you know, you have those partners where like, you know, their habits, like you don't even have to, you don't even have to say like, Hey, let's go and stop that guy. Like you just, you, we already know, you know, you, you're, you you're work so him. well together. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so that this, uh, this radio call comes out of a, uh, of a robbery in progress, uh, suspect had, um, had robbed a liquor store, at seven o'clock in the morning with a knife, with a knife. So we are like literally 10, 15 blocks away 
in downtown. So we're like, hey, let's start rolling over to that call to to assist them. By the time we get there, there's going to be like 50 other officers already there. It's downtown. It's in the morning. It's a you know hot call, robbery in progress, right? So um, so we really weren't even rushing because we were f- far away. So we just kind of start making our way down there. Well. What happens to ship magnets where we were like, I don't know, number four or five on scene. And, uh, we go down this alley that he was let where he was, the suspect was last seen running down and about two blocks away, um, in the alley, we see somebody loosely matching the clothing description of the suspect walking, walking away from us with his back towards us, but just walking real nonchalant. And again, this is seven o'clock in the morning on Monday, people are walking to and from work or, you know, people are going to work. So I looked at my partner. I was like, let's start heading that way. It's probably not our suspect. This guy would be long gone by the time we have, we, we arrived on scene. So we start driving up behind him and, uh, dispatch updates the call and, or the description and says, Hey, the, uh, suspect is going to be a Hispanic male, uh, light skin, Hispanic male with a thin mustache. So as I'm driving up behind the suspect, he kind of looks, he looks back. I just kind of see his eyes. And then he just kind of turns back around, just keeps walking. His hands are out of his pockets. Like he's just walking nonchalant. So I was like, ah, this is probably not going to be our guy. And we start pulling up beside him. He turns around, he looks at me and I'm like, oh man, thin build, light skin, uh, light skin, Hispanic male with a thin mustache. This is probably our guy. So I continue to drive past him and we stop and we get out of the car. And before I could really even say anything to the suspect, he pulls a knife out of the from the top of his jacket with his left hand. And almost simultaneously, he pulls a gun out of his jacket with his right hand. So he kind of pulls them out at the same time. But the f- first thing I saw was the knife. So I started saying, drop the gun. I mean, drop the knife. And then when I my brain picks up that I see a gun and he's the suspect kind of blades off to point it at me. Um, I start shooting. My partner starts shooting suspect starts shooting at me. Um, at least in my mind, I think he's shooting at me. Uh, and then I, I feel something hit my chest. And then the next thing I knew I was laying on my back with my gun pointed right up at the sky. And, and I was like, well, I just got shot and this is a bad day for me and my family. Right. So, uh, I start shooting from between, you know, I'm still laying on my back. Um, I kind of look between my legs and the suspect still bladed off, pointing the gun towards me. My partner's shooting him, the suspect shooting me. I'm shooting the suspect between my legs. And then I'm like, well, I gotta, I better roll like move so I could be a hard target to hit. So I roll over to my stomach and I start shooting from the prone position. And then my slide locks back. I run out of ammo. And I'm laying on top of my magazines. The suspect is still bladed off. He's pointing the gun down at me. And it was that it was that moment of, uh, you know, I, I always say that I there's been times in my life where I thought that I could have died or that I thought I may die. I've never in my life felt, there's never been a moment in my life where I knew I was dying now, that I'm, I'm, I'm not this is it. I'm, I'm going to die. There's never been a moment like that. And it was such a, um, uh, it was such a lonely, lonely, quiet, sad moment. Like just it, it to when I, when I was there, just that feeling of just pure silence and, and, uh, like loneliness. And I knew my partner was shooting at the suspect. And by that time, another officer had arrived on scene two San Diego PD officers are shooting at the suspect, but I just felt so alone. And, uh, I said, well, uh, I'm probably going to get hit in the forehead right now because that's the only thing that's sticking up. You know, I'm still laying on my stomach. And, uh, and I remember thinking, well, am I going to feel the impact hit my forehead? Am I going to feel that? Is my head going to jerk back? Am I going to feel pain? Is it just going to be lights out? Well, I better start fucking moving so I could be a hard tar- hard target to hit. So I roll over to the, uh, I'm trying to roll to the front of the vehicle and I reload. I shoot the suspect. He drops to the ground <laughs> and we're all shooting him. You know, all three of us are shooting the suspect. He hits the ground and then he, he sits up and, and the way he sat up was like the undertaker. You guys ever seen WWF and, and, or WWE now they call it, um, where he, 
he's laying on his back and the suspect literally sits completely up. He grabs the, the gun from the ground, points it right back at me again. And I shoot him three more times and he, and then he falls back. And it was, uh, that, that fucked with me for a couple of days. Cause it was almost like those nightmares that we have where you can't run away from the monster. You're not running fast enough. Um, and you think with the, with the officers out there, I mean, how many rounds had been fired mm-hmm. by that time? I mean, is this guy either bulletproof or are they just not hitting him? Um, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. It, that, I mean, that's what I was feeling like. And, and and that was one of the things that fucked with me too because I, I shot like 30 rounds and and for a couple of you know weeks until I found out that we did actually, we you know, I hit him was that I, I was like, man, did I just miss all my rounds? Did I miss every single shot that I that I shot. I remember the first couple, like two or three, I, I, I'm almost positive that I, I, I struck him because it was like a, there was a way that he, right in the beginning, there was a way that he kind of turned over to the side and he kind of like twitched. Um, it, it was like a real quick, like twitch, but that I, and I, I believe I had, I had hit him. So it, it was just, uh, yeah, it was crazy. So we, we get there and we take him back into custody or we get him in custody and we, they start working on him. And, uh, I had, I had thought that I had been shot. So I actually aired, uh, I aired that I had been hit. My partner came to check on me. He's like, are you all right? And I told him like, dude, I think I'm, I'm hit. And I'm trying to like wipe my chest to, and then looking at my hand to kind of see where, where the blood is at. I'm, I'm wiping underneath my vest and there's no blood, but in my mind, I'm thinking at some point my adrenaline is going to, uh, I'm going to run out of adrenaline and I'm going to start feeling the pain. And, and at some point I, this may be my last breath. Cause I feel like I had felt like I had gotten hit like center, like center in the chest, like right by my BWC. But you had a vest um, on though, right? I had a vest on. Yeah. But in my mind, I'm like trying to find like, where am I hit? But like that there's was no my holes. point is that even though you had a vest on your mind, is playing tricks on you because you should have known you had a vest on. That's the reason why you had that impact. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, but I was never hit. And what happened was I was never even shot at the, the suspect had a pellet gun and what homicide said that, uh, you know, cause it, that fucked with me. I was like, something hit me. Like the suspect must've shot me with the pallet. And they're like, yeah, there was no pallets, I guess, in the gun or whatever. There was nothing found. And, and, uh, so what they think that happened was that when I was shooting the suspect initially, I was running backwards over to my right and your brass, your, your gun spits the brass out the right hand side. They think that from the videos and my BWC, um, they think that I ran into my own brass and, and, and I ate shit at the same time. So my brain put two and two together that that tap you felt was because you got hit and you've been shot. Um, and that's, that's really the only explanation it was just it was just i i ate shit at that perfect moment when i felt something hit my chest um and i still feel to this day that that something hit my chest because i i felt it before i fell back you know and that but that brass i got i was out at the range probably two months ago not this is not your anything close to your story but i'm practicing i've got a glock 40 caliber model 23 and i ended up having to get my glock fixed cuz there was a couple issues with the slide but one of the things was that brass ejected i don't know if you've had this happen Murph, too that brass ejected so hard my son was with me back into my eyebrow it cut my eyebrow i'm bleeding i didn't even know i was bleeding it cut me right then i got hit i'm going wow damn that hurt and then a little bit later i reach up there and i'm going where would this fucking blood come from and i i got a i got a not a big gash but enough of a gash on my head that like i'm going Believe it or not, those things, when they flip out like that, they're coming out with some force. It, I mean, Mm -hmm. you get hit in the head, it hurts. Except me, it doesn't hurt my head, but it hurt my eye. (laughs) (laughs) We got to, uh, uh, that's a, that's, um, that's a, uh, that's a purple heart award right there no, for, not you know getting injured <laughs> getting injured at the range right not there. at the range man. I'm uh, sorry. he just got his wife to come over and kiss his boob and that was it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. no purple hearts for that well so so let's talk about this so this one is the other thing too um that can mess with you right and this is one of the things people don't understand how much it can screw with cops is that you looked at the guy he pulled out the knife. He had what you thought. It doesn't matter what ends up being happened. It's what would a reasonable person reasonably believe. And th- how many of these pellet guns look just like 
real weapons. I mean, people want to do this second get, you know, this Monday morning quarterbacking and second guess. Well, you should have known. Really? Let's try this. Let me do this. I've got two weapons in here. One's real, one's not. You got one tenth of a second to figure out which one's which before you decide <laughs> exactly. to pull the trigger, right? Yeah. Uh, and you know what? People crap their pants, right? That they don't understand what it's like to have a weapon pointed right in your face. You don't have the time. It's what would a reasonable, was there a reasonable threat? Well, look, there was enough of a threat because he had a knife. All you have to do is go to YouTube or watch the videos of these guys who are like, that's the thing that kind of gets me is, have we not seen enough and known enough to know when somebody's sitting there with a knife, you don't sit there with your hand on your weapon. You don't sit there with your arms crossed. And that's what happened. This dude, before they could even react, attacked one of the officers, severely injured him. And the other officer had to shoot this guy. And people with knives are just as dangerous as people with guns. They can move quick before you, before, like you always say, Murph, you know, action is faster than reaction. Absolutely. That, and, you know, just you have friends, I'm sure you guys have too, that I'll ask you, hey, you know, you guys go through a lot of firearms training. Do they treat you to te- teach you to kill or can, can't you just wing the person like you see on television? Shoot them in the leg, shoot them in the knee, you know? And, yeah, right. and these are all people who have never, you know, it, and they'll admit to you they've never fired a weapon or, you know, they were in the military and they spent 25 minutes on the range and that's the, the only weapons they ever fired. So it is an innocent question. But when you take the time to explain to them about adrenaline and, and the 17 foot rule with a knife and, you know, the different things that go along and, and then you tell them about real life shooting situations that you've been in, they get a whole different understanding. But but my wife had an uncle and he was an older gentleman in, in Fort Lauderdale. And he used to he used to drill me all the time. Why can't you just shoot him in the knee? Why can't you shoot that gun out of your hand? I've seen you shoot. You're an excellent shot. And I used to shoot competition. But when somebody else is shooting back at you, the adrenaline pumps way up and that, you know, you try not to jerk the trigger, but it still happens. Very, very true. Yeah. So let's talk- that, I tell you what, man, that is, uh, my heart is racing 100 miles an hour right now, just kind of vicariously living through your shooting there because I can't imagine you're shooting and he's not going down. Yeah. And, and, and I remember, you know, when everybody's shooting him, and I and it's still in my mind. I'm like, I remember thinking, does he have a, does he have a vest on? Like he's everybody's shooting him, and he's not going down. Well, you know, after you know, speed speed up. You know, months months later, we found out that he had he had taken multiple rounds, um, and he was still able at some point to sit right back up the way he did. Uh, let, let me and, guess. Was was meth involved in this one? Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> See? Oh my gosh. Oh, and, and if people wonder why that's such a danger, like remember PCP used to be they see people mm-hmm. used to be dusted. There. It's like they would get so hot they'd take off all their clothes. There's nothing worse than a naked man, you know, sweaty and just hyped up on this stuff that they, they feel no pain. They just have zero threshold for, you know, uh, and it's it is very difficult to use any of your techniques on them. You can, I've even seen the after action reports, you see the, the, the shootings of, of these guys. And it's like, shoot three, four, five, six times. Nothing stops them until you take out the electricity. You know, you can go after the plumbing, like Mike Neal said, I think it was episode eight, but you got to take out the brain. You got to take out the function. Cause otherwise these guys just keep going until they run out of blood. Man, that's, you know, I, I tell you what, Mike, I was going to go take a nap after this interview, but I think I'm too hyped up now. <laughs> I think what I'm going to do after this interview, dude, I got a beer fridge downstairs. I'm having a fucking beer. <laughs> I will drink for you. Now that you guys drink. But let's 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 close off on this because I want to ask you now about what you're doing. But at some point, I mean, you're thinking, "Am I shot or whatever?" But when did these old old memories, this old tapes that were in your head, like from the first ones that caused this? What was your thought now of going about this? Oh my God, here here we go again. I'm going to go back to drinking. I'm going to go back to what was playing through your mind when this was going on or after this happened, and how were things different this time than the first three? Yeah, so that's that's exactly what happened from the moment I finished that. O, you know, the OIS, the officer involved shooting was done. I was getting taken back to you know I was uh, I got into a car with one of the canine a canine officer and he was taking me back to Central Division to start the entire homicide process. Uh, it, I was frightened. I was fright. I, I was frightened because I thought, it, uh, here we go again. Like my whole life is going to go down the shitter right now. I'm going to start drinking the nightmares, the headaches. And it was a, it was a frightening, it was frightening to feel like all the hard work that I've been putting in, 
even from going into treatment and, and years after the fact that, you know, I was still seeing a therapist on a regular basis and I was still doing all these techniques and things that I learned, um, life was so much better. My, my marriage was better. My relationship with my children were better. You know, I was clear headed, like all this was going to come crumbling down. And, uh, and I was, it was, it was, uh, I was, I was scared uh, when I came home and I remember telling my wife, I, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I don't like, you know, it, it was a scary moment for, for her and I, because she didn't know like, well, what, what happens now? We, do we start all over again? But I went into this fight and I, I call this, this is my fight for my life, right? Every, everybody, you know, people who have been involved in critical incidents, everybody has that fight for their life, that moment that they, uh, either they're getting, you know, beaten or they've been shot and stabbed or whatever it may be. This was my fight for my life. And I went into this moment with such a stronger foundation. My, my spirituality was stronger, my marriage, my health my sleep, you know, um, everything was so much more stronger going into this fight. And I bounced back from it so much more easier than all the other three combined. I think maybe for just a couple of weeks, there was a, you know, my sleep was a little thrown off. The alcohol is one of my concerns, right? So when you were going through uh, treatment, what was the advice about alcohol? What happened afterwards and what happened this time? Yeah. So, so I stayed sober, um, for all, when I got out, I got out in December of 2019, I stayed sober from the time I went in. Um, and then in 2021, you know, I, I, I remember talking to my therapist and I was like, Hey, can I have a beer or, or, or am I, am I an alcoholic? I, I didn't know what I was calling it. Like, am I an alcoholic or am I not? And I remember him having the conversation with me, like, well, did you like, when you quit, did you have withdrawals? And I was like, no, I, I didn't have withdrawals. Like I just, it's actually been super easy for me to be sober. It was, it was really easy. The craving for alcohol went away when my symptoms went away. So what I was doing, I was self-medicating. I was using alcohol, but once those symptoms went away and I was doing fine, 2020, 2020, 2021, I mean, literally it was not hard for me to just stay away from alcohol and just say no. I was around alcohol all the time. I'd be, I'd go out with friends when they would go out to the bar drinking and, and I wouldn't, it, it was easy for me. It was easy. So, um, he was like, well, talk to your wife, talk to people who love and care about you. He's like, I personally don't think you're an alcoholic. Like you didn't have withdrawals. You don't, you know, none of that. So new years of 2022, January 1st of 2022, my wife and I had our first drink. Um, she had a glass of wine and we, we, we brought in the new year with, and I had, I had two beers. Well, nine days later I get into my, this OIS mm -hmm. and I was like, holy shit, I can't drink any alcohol. Like I do <laughs> stay away from alcohol. So I literally stayed sober again for, you know, I, my first drink was January 1st of 2022. My shooting was January 10th. And I stayed sober for like another six, seven months. Cause I just didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know how my body was going to react to this OIS. So, um, so I, I, I have, I have beers now. Occasionally I'll have a, you know, I'll have with my food or, you know, if I'm, if I'm, um, hanging out with friends or something, one, one thing I don't use alcohol for, and I make sure that I, 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 uh, it's my rule and I stick to it is, um, I'll, I never use alcohol to cope with a long week or a bad day. Um, I, I try not to use alcohol as any type of coping mechanism for me. If I, if I'm, if I'm going out and hanging out with friends and I have a headache, I'm not going to drink alcohol. Uh, if I'm going out and have friends and I'm feeling good and I want to socialize, or if I'm having a burger and some wings and I want to have a beer, I'll have a beer if, if I want, but I don't use alcohol to cope with anything because I don't want to get, I don't want to get back to that point where I was using it as, as basically a coping mechanism for every single one of my symptoms. But I'm, that's just me. Not everybody is like me. I have friends that they can't be around any alcohol because they'll drink everything in their fridge. Um, so that, that technique, you know, uh, that doesn't work for everybody. For me, that's, that's works for me. Yeah. I, I've got one more question for you because uh, we've gone, we appreciate you giving us so much extra time, Mike. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm here for you guys. 
I drug you guys through the ringer yesterday, having to postpone till today. I apologize. Blame it on my wife. She got a new car. <laughs> oh, oh well, let me. But, what's Connie's number again? <laughs> OU812. <laughs> uh, what, what, who's that behind you with the frying pan? <laughs> 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 um, if So, a lot of our listeners are, are law enforcement, military, first responders. And this could go for anybody. You don't have to be in a dangerous position. You could be a housewife that uh, you, you could be, be anybody. A nurse that dealt with COVID, you know. Yeah. If you had. Let's say one solid piece of advice for people who are going through uh, challenging situations, whether you call it PTSD, uh, sh- shell shocked, uh, just you're just going through a circumstance and you're not sh- sure what to do or how to handle it. What would your advice be for these folks? That's a good question. I I, I would say um, I would say that there is no. Um, you don't you don't realize how sick you are until you get better, until you get healthy, and you can look back and realize what a fucking mess you were. Don't uh, don't wait that long. You know, don't don't get to the point where uh, now you're having to get yourself better, and now you're you know that's that's one of the, that's one of the hardest things to do is to get help or to ask for help, um, and then the second hardest thing is. Re- restoring all those relationships that you fucked up and and that that takes so much more longer it, it uh and don't there's no there's no honor in suffering in silence you suffer but your family suffers and and you know you you owe it to yourself and you owe it to your family you're worth it your family's worth it to just get the help right off the bat don't don't wait like me or other other people it's there's no there's no honor in it there's nothing honorable about suffering in silence um i know that's probably more than one or two pieces of advice but 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 what about you though you talk about your relationships and your family what did it take to to repair your relationship Uh, me and my wife are still working on ours there was a lot of hurt during that time that i that i caused right um and and, and and with other family members too, there was things that I said and and ways that I acted towards family during that time that I was not doing well. And some of those relationships, you, you know, you when just because I'm healthy, you know, back in 2019, I got out and I'm feeling better and I'm you know ready to go and preach to the world about how you know uh, to take care of yourself. Just because I'm doing good. And I'm ready to move on. That doesn't mean your family, your friends, people who you hurt. It's on their time. You know, being forgiven is on, is on, for you to be forgiven, it's on their time. It's not on your time anymore. And that's when, that's the hard part because you think you're, you know, you say you're sorry and you, you're trying to prove yourself, but some relationships will never be restored back to the way they are. Some may some may be even better it just it just depends but i always tell my guys at san diego pd like dude don't don't wait till you're having to sit apologize for years of hurt um because that relationship may never be the same whether it's with your mom or your dad your real brother your real sister your wife husband your children um it's it's not worth it wellness is a perishable skill that's another thing we say you know just like the range just like DTAC, defensive tactics, the range, um, verbal judo, right? The way we talk to people out there so that we don't have to get into a fist fight with them. But wellness, if you're not, if you're not working on that's one thing you're gonna work on for your entire life, not just your career. You may not ever get into a shooting, but your your well wellness, you're gonna work on that every single day when you get off of work. You may never get into a shooting, but if you think about the accidents you drive up on, the homicide scenes, you know, like you say, the burn that that was the one thing I had to work a um, victim inside a car that burned to death, you know, was committing suicide. But uh, it just, you know, the, you, you think about all those things. People think shooting is the only thing that is like the big thing. No, to your point, and I'm glad you made it, it's the accumulation of this stuff over years. And if there's never an outlet for it, it bubbles up until it finds a way out. And when it finds a way out, it's usually destructive um, and hurts people. So what about the work? Yeah. So go ahead, Murph. Sorry. I was going to say, I'm a, I'm a member of the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association, FLEOA, and their motto is, don't go it alone. And that's a perfect motto for this. You don't have to suffer through this alone, man. There's people out there who just waiting to help. 
Yeah. And, and I think a lot of it is like people who have been through critical incidents or people who have been through personal experiences or crazy stuff in their personal life. Um, even the OGs, right. Uh, it, you know, being able to put your ego to the side and, and, uh, and, and take somebody under your wing or just sharing your experience that, that goes, if, 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 a, if a brand new graduating a class from the Academy heard from some, SWAT sniper who had been involved in two OISs and they hear that that person's utilizing resources, whether they're seeing a therapist or going to marriage counseling, when these guys and girls are hearing that from an OG or somebody who that they look up exactly to or my want to point. be like, you start yeah, early. that's how you break the yeah. stigma. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you think there's no, you know, a lot of insurance companies now will pay for it at your job, but if you think you don't have the resources, there's a national hotline dialed 988 988, those three numbers, 988, that's the National Suicide and Crisis Hotline. Don't go it alone, man. Don't don't take a chance. Your life is is worth more than you might think it is at the moment. And the, the folks that you're going to break their hearts if you do something yeah. crazy like suicide, it's just not worth it. 988. Well, Murph, I'm surprised you remember that because he gets 911 screwed up all the time. 199, <laughs> I got that one down pat. <laughs> Hey, one other one other thing too. Once you get once you once you put in that hard work and you get healthier and better, you you uh you realize how much more um time with your kids and, and and life is happier. There's a light at the end of that dark tunnel. If you could just get past that, um life life gets better. You know, you're still gonna have your issues and struggles, but life gets so much better. I look back, I I, I say I look back now and I'm I I look back at things that I was thinking and how I was acting and what I was doing. I'm like, man, I was a fucking mess. And I'm so glad that I didn't, I'm so glad I didn't kill myself. Right. Not that I was going, I never thought of it, but I'm glad I didn't because the joy that I have now years later, like the, 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 the love and the, the, that feeling and that the laughter that I could have with my kids now, you know, um, it, it's so it's worth it. It's, it's worth it. You know, this was so worth uh, having you on here twice. This was, uh, and we'll talk about this in the intro and outro, but um, this this kind of interview was requested by a lot of our listeners, believe yeah. it or not. So that's how important uh, the topics are. So so the our regular listeners, if you're wondering, what the hell, are these guys going back to the old ways of the five-hour interviews? No, we're not. But that's how important this damn topic is. And it, again, it's not just first responders. It can be anybody. It could be you that is listening to us right now. So thank you, Mike. God bless your brother for everything you do. Uh, we'll pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you guys' time and, I, and this opportunity. Thank My you so much. My coping mechanism after these long interviews with Murph is to have a beer. So I'm going to have a beer <laughs> in your honor today. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> I have that effect on people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We got this figured out. And you know, when Murph's whole thing where he said, you know, don't go it alone, he he forgot about that. When we were in San Diego, he asked me to go to the bathroom with him. Why? <laughs> You never, she said, don't go alone. No, that's don't you, go it alone. He got it confused. So You you said you'd never talk about that again. You know that, right? <laughs> well, I didn't until you talked about it. So uh, anyway. Yeah. Hey, I know, I know. Busy. I know. I missed you guys in San Diego too. I was going to come and and stop by at the at the booth and say hi. I, I, I was uh, I I know Mal Mal called me. He's like, "Hey, you coming?" I was like, "Man, I am so busy today. I can't I can't go." I said, "But I'll I'll, I'll see them on the uh, on the podcast in a few weeks." Yeah, so. and we, and we'll be back in San Diego next May. So yeah, uh, right, and actually perfect. Mal talked with us. We're we're working on some cool stuff for next time. So, but we'll definitely be there. We'll look. You keep doing the Lord's work. Uh, keep yes. staying safe. And look, I, I just appreciate what you said is just get in early, get off in, and let these people know. You know, what's worse than not ask, than asking for help? It's not asking for help. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. It's when you don't ask for help. That's when a lot of people suffer. So keep up right. the good work. You know, uh, we're going to keep yes, an eye on you now, Mr. OG. How many All years right. is it now? How many years you got on huh? now? Let's see. Seven, let's just say eight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got to push it up a little seven bit. And Maybe and seven and a half, but eight. No. Go to double digits, man. Make it 10. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. You know, well, you can truthfully <laughs> say, look, I'm, a, I'm coming on 10 years. Well, I still got three years to go, but I'm coming on 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I'm going to start using that, actually. Yeah, I'm coming up on 10 years soon. Yeah, I'm thinking about putting in my papers and retiring here, you know, pretty soon. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I don't see I don't see the, I don't see the light at the end of that tunnel yet, but it'll, it'll come, I'm sure. It's a train, pal. It's a train. That's right. That's the train coming at you. <laughs> well, look, hey, man, seriously, great stuff. Thank you for doing this. Stay safe. Keep the people of San Diego safe. Uh, you guys don't go anywhere. Everybody else, stay tuned for the debrief.
Well, hey, this is us again saluting you, Michael, for coming on, being so transparent, mm-hmm. being authentic about going through what you did and owning it. You didn't you didn't run away from it. You didn't make excuses. I mean, you owned it. Um, but by doing that, you also showed other people why it's important that you mental health is a huge issue in public service, whether it's you're, you're a nurse, uh, if you're a firefighter, you're you're a paramedic, you know, you're a police officer, anybody who's Anybody who's dealing with this kind of stuff day in, day out needs this kind of help. And, uh, you know, I'm just, God bless him. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. what I'm thankful for is he didn't end up becoming one of the uh, um, silent victims who commit suicide because he said he wasn't thinking about it. But, you know, that's what he said two years in. Who knows what it would have been three years in? Absolutely. I, and I echo that 100 percent, Mike. Thanks for your for your honesty, for your openness. Um, you know, in, in law enforcement, there's a ton of type A personalities and, and all of us think we're studs and we're above this and we don't need help. And you saw what happened when Mike didn't get help. But then you saw what happened when he did get help. So the fact that you're coming on and being open and honest, I just I can't say thank you enough. Uh, I apologize to you that we weren't able to get together when I was out in San Diego, but uh, we'll be back out there in May of 24. Morgan and I'll be out there again with Mel and Santi and, and the whole crew. And I definitely want to meet you in person, brother, because you're an inspiration to us all. And for our listeners, keep in mind, if you need help, if you need help, 988, just dial 988. There is somebody on the other end of that phone, 24-7, 365. As Morgan says, you don't have to go this alone. Get some help. Please get some help. It's just, we all have tough times. We all go through depressive uh, events. We all suffer from anxiety from time to time. There's nothing, no reason in the world that I can think of that, that you should commit suicide. Uh, so please, please, 988, make the call if you need help. Yeah, and the holidays are a tough time for everybody. So, you know, just remember that, 988. All right, so we hope you guys enjoyed this. Share it with your friends, especially if you've got folks in the law enforcement, public safety, you know, first responder profession. Share this with them. And if you enjoyed it, go to Apple, hit that, and Spotify. Hit those five stars. And in fact, on Spotify, you can leave comments. Let us know what you thought about this episode. Um, you know, it's really important to us to know that we're reaching with the right message mm-hmm. to the right people. So let us know. Also head on over to game of crimes, podcast.com for more information about the show. Also a couple of Mike's videos are on there. So we'll try and update that if we get some additional things. Um, also, uh, game of crimes fans go to facebook.com type in game of crimes fans, join our little inside group run by Sandy Salvato, the mafia queen, the, uh, iron fist with the velvet glove, uh, all fun things happen behind the curtain there. Mm-hmm. And also, also follow us on that thing they call social media at game of crimes on Twitter, game of crimes on podcast, uh, a Game of Crimes podcast on Facebook and the Instagram, but visit us at patreon.com slash Game of Crimes because we got, like I said, our case of the month we got fired up on. We got some good things uh, coming up this month for our Narco Meter Review, uh, Black Klansman. Uh, I, I personally vouch for Murph on this movie. It is far better. In fact, uh, watching Winnie the Pooh would have been better than Miami Vice. So I'm not going to let you get a, I'm not going to let you get away with that. Uh, well, yeah, sadly, I have to agree with you. That was a horrible selection, but I'm doing better. I'm doing better. I'm we doing better. I'm getting make. better, mate. It's just a flesh wound, and we hope you guys seriously had a great Thanksgiving. Keep yourself safe yep. for Christmas, and thank you guys once again for playing the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all: the post-turkey apocalypse game of crime. <laughs>